Right. Well, we know a few things after having measured the oscillator circuit. Um, actually, it's quite positive. It means, one, that at least the high frequency oscillator tube, which is the 1R5, works. Uh, we know it's filament work, obviously, and we also know the high voltage works. So that confirms, sort of, that my high voltage power supply um, seems to work okay correctly that is so we know the the filament of the 1r5 gets power so it's high highly likely that all the other tubes get filament power as well we know the high voltage works so i can assume that all the other tubes get high voltage or B plus as well. Uh, we know the oscillator works, so it's likely that if I would inject a high frequency signal, a modulated one, into the antenna of the radio, that I would probably be able to detect IF signal as well. Now, what we also know, so what I also did, was I measured uh, the uh, sound transformer, yeah, or, or rather the primary of the sound transformer. Uh, and I measured it quite simply by injecting a audio signal into the primary. And um, it seems to work. So, although the sound, I must say, is, excuse me, a rather faint coming from the speaker, but uh, I, I think the speaker, this type of speaker, is not the right type uh, for this radio. Uh, anyway, I know the transformer, the output transformer works. But, um, until now... I can't seem to get any sort of sound out of the speaker. Okay, so uh, obviously the whatever high frequency signal comes through uh, or comes out of the 1R5, so the high frequency tube yeah, or the, the mixer oscillator as it were, um, gets blocked somewhere within the circuit. So what I need to do now is to find out where it is blocked. Okay, so if we take a look at the IF cans, you know, the the thing is, if you look at the at the schematic, okay, and let me take a pointer. You you can tell there are capacitors uh, in the IF uh, or around the IF cans, okay. So there's one here and here. This is the first IF can, and then there's one capacitor here and one there. Yeah, around the second IF can. So we can assume that uh, either one of the IF cans is broken. So in other words, the transformer is broken and then we have a big problem. Uh, or uh, one of these for capacitors is bad, possibly. Another thing that we could look at is that if this tube here, which is the 3S4, okay, is the amp, and, and you could say 
via the amplification tube, okay? So you, you see a few capacitors and resistors that ultimately go to the grid of the amplifier. So if one of these resistors or capacitors is bad, it's possible the sound can be blocked here as well. Normally I don't lose my cool over a radio which I'm restoring um, but this radio here is really testing my patience. Um, funnily enough uh, although at first it seemed like it would start to work um, it suddenly stopped working and um, I replaced all the, the resistors which were out of tolerance well all when I say all I say three resistors and uh, initially it seemed like it would start to work again yeah whereas it stopped working before but then it, it just stopped working entirely now I temporarily replaced the um, electrolytic which is completely dead yeah with with a new electrolytic this one here and I thought maybe that would solve at least part of my problem but it seems like it didn't so uh, what I'm going to try is you see here there's a sort of a couplet uh, which consists really of a number of capacitors and if I'm not mistaken uh, I think it's about five capacitors let's see uh, one two three four yeah, five capacitors in one couplet. Now, the only reason I think they did it like that is just to save some space. Now, unfortunately for me, this couplet is really what defines this little radio as well as what it is. So I would really not like to have to replace it um, so what I'm going to do is to temporarily tack in uh, a few capacitors here and there and see whether that improves the working of the radio which in my opinion it should uh, and and if it if if it does then I'll try to find a, a way of restoring this which is optically pleasing let's say which at first I got stuck in a rut uh, meaning that I was really getting nowhere with this little radio um, and um, well you know the uh, local oscillator uh, initially had worked and then it stopped working and then it worked a tiny little bit and now it starts to work again you know as you can tell over there on the scope yeah if I change the variable tuning capacitor okay hang on yeah well you can see the frequency changes as I tune the variable capacitor up and down okay so actually I got the uh, local oscillator working again uh, which makes me very very happy now um, the thing is you know I had to uh, well maybe I'm exaggerating when I say rip apart but still I had to uh, deconstruct the radio a little bit to be able to figure out what was going wrong with it and as you can tell I unmounted the uh, potentiometer which doubles as an on off switch and um, to be able to reach the local oscillator circuitry 
which is down there okay so if I take a pointer so where the scope is attached yeah that little white thing over there that's the top of the local oscillator coil okay and um, well like I just said the local oscillator refused from oscillating and I'll show you the offending part if you give me a moment actually I should say offending parts so in the plural because um, there were actually quite a few parts which weren't good yeah and one of those parts which really uh, well made me suffer a bit uh, trying to get the local oscillator to work again was this little thing here yeah which is a uh, capacitor I don't know if it's a mica capacitor or a paper capacitor disguised as a mica but um, its value is is actually 100 picofarad okay so it's a 100 picofarad uh, capacitor and um, if I'm not mistaken it's rated at 100 volts so if you uh, look at the lower row of dots you see brown black black which to me sounds very much like 100 or 100 volts um, I measured it and it, it measures way too high it measures something like 140 picofarad which um, is, is really too high since the schematic says it should be uh, 100 pico and not 140 so it's a, a 40 percent uh, deviation from its its rated value so this is is definitely bad okay then there was also a resistor of 100k which is this one here yeah and this one uh, so it's brown black yellow which means 100k okay um, this one rated more like 139k so which is 40% over value as well which is way way too much okay and when I'm talking about these two parts let me show you on the schematic um, hmm, let me see if I can make a close-up so you can see what I mean So right down there, you're looking at the local oscillator. Okay, let me find something to point with. Okay, so what was wrong was this part here. You see here? That part here is 100K. And that was 40K or, or thereabouts over value. And right next to it, you see this part here, and that's the 100 picofarad, and that was also almost 40% over value. So, um, I had to replace them, and the thing is, of course, that uh, uh, those parts were hidden behind the potentiometer you see here okay and and of course uh, that was the hardest place to get at so rather than 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 try to uh, solder and and uncouple all sorts of parts uh, stuck behind a potentiometer I took the radical step of of uh, well and mounting the potentiometer but I had to be a little bit careful because these little tabs you see here which hold the potentiometer to the chassis you see the slots down there okay are not very strong so if I bend and unbend them too many times they will certainly break so I had to be really 
a bit careful with that. And you can tell how small they are seeing my finger underneath them. Okay, so they are really, really tiny. Anyway, um, a lot of capacitors, I think, are turning out to be bad. Um, and unfortunately for me, um, it looks more and more like I will have to shotgun, uh, so to speak, the whole chassis and replace the capacitors one by one um, to uh, improve its functioning. Now, I have been trying to give it an alignment, so I sent um, 455 kilohertz through this coil of wire into the antenna uh, rod and uh, when I listen I can hear very faintly the uh, modulated IF uh, signal coming through but it's oh so faint so my problem is that uh, as it is actually uh, I, I can't get very much out of it I also tried, of course, to realign the IF cans, you know, by turning the the little uh, screws on top of it, and um, it did improve the reception of the IF signal somewhat, but it's really minimal. So my problem is now that I need to replace. Uh, the capacitors one by one until I get a maximum reception of the IF signal um, and um, unfortunately for me that means most probably replacing this um, uh, let me take a pointer here so down here you see this this brown little thing here it's really uh, a, a kind of a couplet which contains five capacitors and uh, unfortunately for me most capacitors are inside this couplet so it means that I will have to probably replace all the capacitors which are in in this couplet and and then there are also a few capacitors which are not built in uh, that and and you see one here on the uh, potentiometer yeah and then you see one right here and then there are a couple of of others here now my my problem is that uh, most probably all the capacitors are paper capacitors and 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 not what you would initially think uh, a kind of mica capacitor which of course would would prove that most capacitors went bad yeah uh, mica capacitors are not known to go bad very quickly or very often but paper capacitors, um, even if they are in, encased in, in this kind of uh, mica type cases, well, inevitably paper capacitors will go bad. So um, what I need to do really is to uh, replace the capacitors one by one and hope that the, the functioning of the radio will improve. So far I've replaced five capacitors uh, in the radio and I marked them the capacitors I replaced with with pink uh, alcohol pen and uh, although the radio is still not functioning quite satisfactorily um, I do detect uh, much more life in the radio so to speak now I'm pumping uh, a 455 kilohertz signal into the radio, which I loosely coupled. So, in other words, I uh, placed 
the signal input, yeah, the, the signal I'm transmitting, uh, not by making full contact with the electronics, but by clamping the signal uh, output around the wire of one of the wires of the antenna. Okay, I replaced all but two capacitors and um, I'm injecting the 455 kilohertz modulated uh, IF signal uh, via a coil of wire into the antenna and this is the result So you can hear the IF signal, so that's a, a good thing. Now there's also a lot of noise of course, but um, <coughs> it has never been uh, otherwise where I live. I mean, there are uh, so many uh, appliances and so much equipment all around me and at my neighbor's place and all that, that it's inevitable I get all sorts of crackling and, and, and noises. Now, in regard to the capacitors, so I said I replaced uh, all but two capacitors and um, actually I should say I have to replace only one capacitor, but there are two Okay, let me explain with the schematic. Okay, so here's the schematic. Okay. So all the capacitors you see marked in purple or in pink uh, are the ones that I replaced. Now, the problem is, let me take a pointer. Hang on. The problem is this one right here, right here, this one. Now, this one is attached to the end stage tube, okay? And it's in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, let me see. It is, yes, it's the lower one okay so it's this one right here this one is the 250 picofarad you see right here okay but the strange thing is there is another 250 picofarad this one and this one is not marked anywhere in the schematic not anywhere and that's the weird thing I can't get my head around it but what capacitor that could be okay so at first I thought oh it's this one right here the 5 nanofarad or the 5000 picofarad right here but no 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 I did replace it I just didn't uh, highlight it with, with uh, alcohol ink so where the heckens is that second 250 picofarad capacitor and aside from this one right here yeah there's only one more of 250 picofarad and that's this one right here yeah but I already replaced this one so I can only find one possible explanation for the second one and that's a uh, last-minute factory uh, change all right I uh, I'm trying to get some life out of the radio as you well know but when I touch my probe to the output 
of the second IF stage, this is what I get. Squealing, actually. Um, it, it, it sounds as if it would be receiving something, but uh, when I turn the uh, the uh, tuning capacitor, I only get a sort of squealing out of the radio. And uh, I'm not sure what the cause of the squealing could be. Also, to my opinion, um, the sound is a little bit weak. So I might have to investigate what is keeping the sound back. Just because you assume that the, the battery would rest uh, uh, with its negative pole on, on the spring uh, and that that would be sufficient to uh, pass current to the whole chassis well you'd be wrong okay so um, I've got my multimeter on continuity tester okay so okay now I've got my test lead my one test lead connected up to the spring yeah which represents the negative pull of the battery holder okay so touching the spring does give continuity now watch this still works okay nothing absolutely nothing no matter where I touch my test lead nothing now I test this this is one of the aluminum rivets nothing ah here a little bit nothing 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 I decided to give the radio a rest for the moment and concentrate on the capacitors which I collected out of the radio and uh, I'm going to try to well to restuff some of them anyway uh, and see whether I can I can manage to do it now uh, some might prove challenging like these two up here which are rather narrow in build so I don't know if I, I'll be able to stuff them and this is also quite narrow seen from the side yeah it contains five capacitors all of them are bad as are these by the way which makes me suspect that they are all paper capacitors so this one might prove a challenge uh, these two might be challenging these perhaps a little bit less because the capacitors they are are 2 250 pico and 1 100 okay so like this this is the 100 these two are the 250 pico and then of course we have the electrolytic um, I haven't decided quite yet how I would gut this one without damaging it too much but probably I will try to cut through that brown phenolic separator you see down there
Okay. <clears throat> okay, I gutted the capacitor with a ball grinder like this. Okay. And uh, this is the result. So, two empty shells. Which I will stuff with a small capacitor, something like this. I was getting so tired of whenever I grind something to be flooded with a very fine obnoxious dust that I decided to build myself a sort of a, a miniature clean room as it were. And actually what it is, is nothing more than a, a cardboard box with uh, a front made of cling film. You know, the kind you can buy in, in shops uh, and uh, you use to pack airtight uh, food with you know you when you take your sandwiches out uh, to work or to school you can wrap them in cling film and this is exactly what i'm using it's uh, nearly as transparent as glass yeah and i use a very simple uh, cardboard box uh, of around about or oh, i would say mm, 25 centimeters so 10 inch uh, by each side, you know, so depth, height and width is about 10 inches. And then I cut three holes into the box. And the holes are, the, are not arbitrary. Um, it's, in fact, the hole that would permit me to uh, put my fist into the box and pull it back out again without uh, getting caught um, inside the box okay so yeah you could say the hole is about the size of my fist okay so um, yeah actually it's, it's quite simple and I cut a third hole on top uh, to set my LED uh, lab light above it and and that illuminates, of course, the inside of the box. set the blade for some reason it always shakes loose
there you go um, I don't know if you can see it but next to those little pieces of latex of my gloves you see a layer of dust and you see a fingerprint in it okay so uh, it's a fine yellowish dust that I ground uh, off the capacitor and uh, although the case did not quite catch all the dust um, it did catch quite a bit of it for which I'm immensely happy because that means at least I'll breathe a bit easier and uh, not everything will be coated in that obnoxious yellowish dust okay so these are the two pieces of the shell of the capacitor okay so the back piece and the front piece and um, I hollowed them out with a ball grinder just enough to make space for the replacement capacitor I'm going to put in it now um, when I clean the capacitor housing yeah or uh, the well the body the gutted body of the capacitor I don't use anything else but either um, demineralized water or a bit of ammonia now why don't I use uh, for example alcohol well alcohol um, dissolves hot glue so even if there are some only some traces of alcohol left in the body of the capacitor's shell um, it would probably be enough to corrode as it were or to make the the, the hot glue loosen up or, or weaken sufficiently that it will fall apart something we don't want of course then of course I could use acetone but then acetone has a very nasty uh, property to be able to dissolve um, ink and or paint and that we don't want either yeah we want to preserve the the coloring on the capacitor so uh, acetone is out so I could still use something like petrol but petrol um, no matter how well distilled it is um, has the disadvantage that it still leaves a very very thin film of oil on any surface and um, oil as you know reduces the amount of, of grip glue has on any surface that's why in general we clean surfaces with alcohol uh, to uh, wash away as it were any oily residues now I'm preparing to uh, uh, glue in the replacement capacitor so I'm going to try to give you a live feed of how I go about it so I um, switched my uh, hot glue gun on and I'm waiting for it to heat up what you need to do is to prepare the pieces you're going to glue together um, in such a way that they are oriented correctly so this is the piece onto which I will glue the replacement capacitor this is the back of the piece yeah now this I oriented in such a way that I just need to flip it over like this on top of this okay so what I'm going to do first is um, I'm going to place a glob 
not too big of hot glue right in the center of the piece here I hope the glue is hot enough yes it is there it is okay this is all a bit fiddly so you need to be and you need to be well reasonably quick because the glue sets rather quickly don't worry about the 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 little filaments the glue makes when you pull it away um, that can all be fixed later on so no worries there okay so i try to center the capacitor inside the glob of glue like this okay so there you go it's centered nicely inside <clears throat> the glob of glue what I'm going to do now is glob some more put some more glue on top of that so that we can sandwich it together yeah so uh, I'm being reasonably liberal with my glue uh, not exaggerating but like I said uh, if there is too much glue we can fix that later on okay so now I put the back on top of the sandwich of glue yeah and I try to center it and you know so that it fits the back rather well there okay I think that's okay <coughs> I don't know if you can see this but uh, I've got all the light I have in in the room available shining on it okay so I've got a sandwich now of the two halves of the capacitor yeah and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drip hot glue all around the open edge uh, yep like this and don't worry if if initially the, the the two edges don't fit very well or are a little bit skewed or whatever it, it doesn't really matter we can finish that off we can finish that off later on yeah the only thing you should try not to do is to spill any glue on the front or back side of the capacitor yeah that's what we want to try to keep as clean as possible um, if you spill glue on the, the the leads of the capacitor or well or if you have filaments of glue just floating in the air <clears throat> that's really not a problem okay so you just pull them away and and you'll see I, I can fix all that later on no problems okay so here we go well, I'm being quite liberal actually with the glue uh, I don't nearly need that much glue but pff, you know it's only a little bit of glue and nothing more so I'm not really concerned about losing any appreciable amount of glue and by the way um, in case you you are wondering where you could find um, brown hot glue like I'm using well I would suggest you browse on online shops you know like eBay or something like that 
and you go look in the beauty section for the ladies because actually this hot glue is used to attach hair extensions uh, onto ladies hair yeah so if a girl wants to make her hair look longer or if she wants to attach colored strands of special nylon uh, say threads into her hair to give her hair color well then they use hot glue and this brown hot glue is actually sort of natural brunette color yeah so there you go this is the almost finished product so the brown color of this glue is actually tuned you could say for use with brunettes well, it's only accidentally actually that I found out that they use hot glue for um, for <coughs> extending hair pieces and all that but by actually watching some documentary on TV but I thought it was a pretty neat neat trick to use hot glue to do that and I suddenly realized hey but they are using colored hot glue and uh, of course they were using hot glue of a different color in that documentary but I thought well if they have red or blue or yellow they probably must have brown so I started looking around and what do you know I found brown hot glue um, it, I bought it probably not nearly as cheaply as probably I could somewhere uh, but uh, all things considered the price was I thought reasonable I don't know something like six dollars or so for a pack of I think 12 rods of glue so uh, yeah well okay so I as you can tell I cut away the excess with my surgical knife okay taking care of course not to cut my own finger uh, but this is this is only rough cleaning up now what I'm doing in the background is I'm heating up my soldering iron okay uh, you don't need huge heat you know 200 degrees would probably do but I work a bit hotter uh, because the glue melts quicker and I can shape the glue that way a bit easier at least in my opinion that's what it is okay so wait a minute okay there you go okie dokie okay so there you go the glue is cut away so now all the excess glue is gone now I take my hot soldering iron okay and what I do is I lightly touch the glue like this and you see it it almost melts instantly uh, don't worry if your iron smokes a bit um, it cleans off 
rather easily so no worries there okay so and you you don't need to linger on the glue okay so you just pass over it rather quickly like this and there you go it's it's shiny and it's flat and it's it's perfect so you only need to touch it lightly like this don't push on it too hard either yeah and try not to put your finger on the hot glue let it harden by its own accord and it will remain nice and smooth because if you touch it it will you will push your own fingerprint into it and and it will look well unfinished of course you shouldn't burn yourself doing this but if you try it a couple of times I'm sure you'll manage uh, okay so now I see there is still a gap here okay so right here there's still a gap so what I, I do is I take a little bit of the excess glue that I cut away a tiny piece yeah and I stuff it into that hole or I, I put it on top uh, according to what goes easiest mm, this is a bit too big I take a small piece like this yeah so there you go I <coughs> stuffed a little piece on top and what I do is I, I simply melt it like that on top and if it isn't enough I just keep adding a little bit of, of glue at a time no need to go cuckoo with it just add a little piece at a time and melt it inside the gap like this there you go course taking care not to burn your own finger but there you go yeah. uh, uh, yeah okay nearly done just a little bit more voila there you go completely restored a capacitor now the only thing I need to do is finish a little bit more the edges with a tiny sliver of glue and my uh, soldering iron and this capacitor is done if you're wondering how I clean off the the glue which is on uh, rests on the tip of my iron after I shaped the hot glue well I just use a soft wire brush like this you know this these are all brass wires very thin brass wires and I just clean it off like this there you go as clean as a whistle just by passing lightly a brass wire brush over it like this and that's it clean as a whistle we're all ready to use for soldering 